Hello students, this is Professor McDermott. Uh, with the first of your video lectures uh, for the course, you may ask the question, why uh, do you want to deliver lectures by video as opposed to just lecturing in class? Well, I think you'll find that a number of professors uh, have started to do this. It's basically a way to get you some of the, the content of the course um, outside the classroom via the internet so that we have more in-class time for um, really higher quality activities like discussions or group activities um, and, 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 and thus we can make a better use of class time and since the readings from the textbook are optional <clears throat> for my courses uh, I uh, hope and I trust that this will not be too burdensome to you uh, the topic for this first video lecture is um, early Mesopotamia. Uh, at the end of the lecture on prehistory, I mentioned that um, the origins of civilization are found in four um, regions of the world. And what they all had in common was uh, that these early civilizations grew up around uh, rivers. In fact, uh, this name Mesopotamia is a Greek word that means the land between two rivers. And the two rivers in question you see here on the map are the Tigris and the Euphrates um, River. Um, some of you uh, or some of your close relatives or friends perhaps may have actually had experience or even been to the Tigris and Euphrates River area um, because this is mostly the modern-day country of Iraq and so uh, many uh, many American men and women have had occasion to go there in the last uh, 20 or so years um, this uh, fertile crescent as it was called uh, became one of the birthplaces of civilization um, because agriculture took root in this region around the Tigris and Euphrates River, uh, hence the name Fertile Crescent. A lot of crops were grown here, but um, this was not an easy process and it was precisely the difficulty of agriculture in this region that gave rise to civilization there. I'll explain that in just a moment. Uh, last point from the map though, Mesopotamia had three major regions. Uh, the early period of Mesopotamian history was dominated by the region of Sumer um, in the southeast uh, portion of the map and the city-states of Sumer uh, such as Ur, Uruk, and Babylon. Later periods of Mesopotamian history saw other regions like Akkad in central Mesopotamia and Assyria in northwest Mesopotamia um, come to the forefront. But this early period of Mesopotamian history was dominated by the Sumerians. Um, and they were the ones to inaugurate civilization in Mesopotamia. Now what does this word civilization actually mean? It comes from the Latin word kiwis, C-I-V-I-S, kiwis, which simply means city. And so a civilization is a culture that has developed cities or uh, urban life and in fact uh, Mesopotamia was dominated by uh, what we call city-states. Essentially for most of Mesopotamian history the different cities were uh, like individual countries. Um, each city in a sense was its own nation and um, each city would have its own god or goddess that the people would turn to uh, for help and it had its own political system and its own uh, rulers. Um, occasionally in Mesopotamian history as we'll see some great ruler would unite Mesopotamia but uh, the real the normal situation was uh, having all of these separate city-states who often were at each other's throats. But the reason why the cities developed in Mesopotamia again had to do excuse me with agriculture with farming um, and farming was not easy in this area uh, first of all Mesopotamia only got about eight inches of rain um, per year and so it was pretty much a desert 
except for um, the rivers. And so the water that was needed to for the crops had to come primarily from uh, the rivers. Um, when it did rain, the storms were often very violent and um, terrifying. And the rivers themselves were not very cooperative. Uh, every year, the Tigris and the Euphrates would flood. And this flood came at exactly the wrong time for farmers. Now, in the Middle East, because the summers are so hot, farmers typically plant crops the very end of autumn or the beginning of winter, and the crops are harvested in the spring. And these uh, floods of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers happened during the spring harvest, which was really a disaster for agriculture in Mesopotamia. And so it became necessary for the people of this region, if they were going to farm at all, to develop very complex systems of irrigation to control the floods, to keep the floodwaters off the fields at harvest time in the spring, and to stockpile the water so that it could be used when they needed it at the beginning of the growing season in uh, the winter. Um, and it was this complexity of the irrigation system in the region that forced people to cooperate, to come together in these city-states so that they could work together to develop these very complicated systems. And they did so, and it was, um, was quite successful. And the byproduct was the emergence of this great civilization based on these city-states. And the presence of the city-states and the fact that people were organized and urbanized helped also to give rise to a number of other very important innovations in human culture that uh, started in Mesopotamia during the fourth millennium BC. That is uh, the period from 3000 years before Christ to 3999 years before um, the birth of Christ. Um, the fourth millennium BC. And among these great inventions of the Mesopotamians were the plow, um, and the wheel, which uh, at first the Mesopotamians used primarily in warfare um, as, as part of a chariot, um, ch uh, chariot warfare being the predominant form of warfare during that early period. Um, also, the system of writing that we call cuneiform was pioneered in uh, Mesopotamia. And uh, this system is great for historians actually because uh, basically they would take uh, a bit of clay and they would write on the clay with a wedge that was called a cuneus in Latin. It, it just means wedge. It was just like a pen that they used to write uh, symbols in the clay and then they would bake the clay in a, in a kiln just the same way you would do with a pot if you were taking a ceramics class. And as a result, you had uh, these very durable clay tablets, and, and, and we have uh, many thousands of these, uh, so many that most of them have never even been deciphered, um, down, you know, that have come down to us the present day because this was a very durable form of, of uh, writing. Um, cuneiform writing uh, was a very complicated system, and uh, only uh, the priests and trained scribes, professional writers, knew how to read and write um, cuneiform. Um, but this also really helped to advance civilization in Mesopotamia. Finally, um, bronze uh, came in to Mesopotamia towards the end of this fourth millennium BC. Uh, what is bronze? Bronze is a, a metal alloy um, in which copper is combined with um, tin or, or sometimes another metal. Um, but essentially these uh, metals are melted down, mixed together, allowed to harden. The result is bronze, which is both uh, more durable and easier to work with than copper uh, taken alone. And so uh, starting about 3000 BC and going all the way down to around 1200 BC, um, most weapons and most implements uh, were made of bronze, and so we call this the bronze 
age. Uh, very important advance in civilization as well. Now, um, a very important feature of each Mesopotamian city-state was the ziggurat. Uh, and I mentioned that each city typically would have its own god or goddess that the citizens would honor above all others, and that god or goddess would have um, his or her a ziggurat or temple at the heart of the city. Uh, the most famous Mesopotamian ziggurat <laughs> uh, that you may have heard of is found in the Bible in the book of Genesis where uh, you may recall the story of the Tower of Babel uh, in which uh, the people of Babel build this very very large uh, structure going up to the heavens um, and God uh, in the Hebrew Bible becomes concerned about this and he's concerned that human beings are getting too uppity and too big for their britches and so he destroys this Tower of Babel and to punish the people he sentences them to have different languages. This is how the Hebrews explained the origin of different languages but the point of that was to keep the people human, the human race from becoming too powerful or too organized um, and Right there you see the difference between the Hebrew culture <laughs> and the Mesopotamian culture because Mesopotamian culture was powerful and organized and, and Hebrew culture was less so, as we will see. Um, Babel was simply the name in the English translation of the Hebrew Bible for Babylon, uh, one of the greatest Mesopotamian um, city-states. So this Tower of Babel was really the ziggurat of Babylon. Uh, but the temple uh, or ziggurat in each city-state was important in many other aspects of life besides uh, religion. First of all, it had supreme importance normally in, in economic life of the people because typically under the Sumerians it was the temple that owned all the land. Um, so if you were a farmer, you didn't own your own land, you essentially rented it from the temple priests, and so you were what's known as a tenant um, farmer, uh, renting the land from, from the temple. And so the priests of the temple had power to uh, organize uh, the economy in each city-state normally, and so uh, they, as farm surpluses grew, as agriculture developed in Mesopotamia, uh, that meant the priests could begin to assign uh, people to other kinds of jobs besides farming, because um, not everyone needed to be a farmer any longer. And so uh, it was the priests who would recruit people for uh, the military, or for government jobs, or to become scribes, for example, or, or potters, or weavers or you know whatever tasks needed to be done aside from farming and so the priests played a very key role in the development of the economy uh, in this early civilization also in terms of science and mathematics and our calendar our modern calendar is based on uh, the phases of the moon and really we owe that to the priests of the temples of ancient Sumer because they were the first ones to develop this lunar calendar based on the cycles of the moon. Another uh, aspect of our everyday life that we owe to these Sumerian priests has to do with how we tell time. Have you ever wondered uh, why we tell time in units of 60? 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour? I mean, normally our number system in our culture is based on the number 10, right? So why do we use 60 to tell time? Well, it's because Mesopotamian mathematics were based on the number 60, not 10. And because these priests of the Sumerian temples came up with early systems of telling time, they used 60 as the base number um, for telling time, and that's why uh, we continue to follow that precedent to this very day. Um, so these would have been some of the great scientists and mathematicians of the ancient world. Another biblical story you may be familiar with in the New Testament, when Jesus is born, it says 
three magi or wise men came from the east uh, in the gospel of luke came from the east to uh, bring gifts to the infant jesus and uh, these magi would uh, if we accept the story at face value would probably have been uh, priests of um, gods from this region of Mesopotamia or perhaps from a little farther east in Persia. Um, so you see that these people were famed throughout the ancient world for their scientific and mathematical skills. Finally, um, the uh, Sumerian temple priests also normally played a key role in, in politics and many uh, Sumerian city-states were actually ruled by priests, um, priest kings, uh, NC in their language, E-N-S-I, and N -S, uh, an NC was a priest king uh, who ruled from the temple. This was a very common way of organizing politics. Speaking of politics, um, it's interesting, this illustration here uh, shows the ziggurat of Ur, which was restored and reconstructed by the late dictator of Iraq, Saddam Hussein, who was toppled by uh, United States and coalition forces in the Second Persian Gulf uh, War and, and uh, later killed. And of course, Saddam was a terribly evil dictator and a horrible man, but uh, you have to give him credit for being a little bit more careful with the historical record than some of the rulers who have come after him, uh, especially the leaders of the group known as ISIS, who for a while took over a large portion of Iraq and, and Syria, um, and set about systematically destroying ancient monuments, temples, inscriptions, um, you name it, uh, because they see them as pagan um, artifacts and, and being very de uh, strict, devout, fundamentalist Muslims, they see them as an abomination. And so this group called ISIS has uh, really, really devastated the record of human s civilization in this region. It's a real tragedy. They've even killed um, historians and museum curators who have tried to protect these uh, ancient artifacts. And so um, really, uh, the record of human culture in this area has suffered terribly from, from the turmoil and upheaval there in the last two decades. Now, uh, I mentioned that the priests were often also kings, and we may think of that as a very odd arrangement. In the United States, obviously, we, we believe in the separation of church and state, and um, that the church should not play a major role in, in public political life. So this may seem strange and, and foreign to us and, and, and the kind of society we would not want to live in. Um, but it's interesting, if you look at the records, you see that there were some advantages for ordinary people of having the priests in control. And um, one set of interesting documents comes from the city-state of Lagash uh, from about the 12th 24th century BC. And by the way, if you see those letters CA period, that means circa or about 24th century BC. We can't date them exactly, but we think they're approximately from that century. Um, and the ruler of the city state of Lagash was a man named Uru Inim Gina. And this ruler decided that he needed to get the great landowners of his kingdom under of his city state under control and he decided to use the temple priests to achieve that and he started giving the priests a great deal more power in uh, the society of Lagash specifically the power to regulate the economy and to regulate uh, family life um, and as you could expect when the priests were in control, they did implement some strict moral reforms. Uh, for example, they forbade women to have more than one husband, what we call polyandry. Previously, um, women were allowed to have more than one husband. And whenever I mention this in class, the, the women all, always give me this look like, why on earth would they want that? Uh, <laughs> uh, but in any case, uh, Polyandry was common before Uru and Amgina, um, but the priests banned it 
uh, this practice banned this practice even though men were still allowed to have concubines in addition to their wife if the wife did not give them children. Um, on the other hand, the priests did a lot to help women, especially widows and orphans, uh, and under the, 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 this new priestly leadership, widows and orphans, uh, that is parentless children, were exempted from all um, taxes. And so they did do a lot to protect those very vulnerable and at-risk people. And also the priests helped to protect ordinary farmers from having their um, plots of land and uh, that they rented and their goods seized by, uh, by wealthy landowners. And so um, these reforms were implemented as a way of getting the wealthy, powerful landowners under control. And effect very effectively, the priests of Lagash did accomplish just that. And so you can see that um, even though it may seem strange to us, this priestly role in the economy and political life could bear good fruit, at least for some people, in Mesopotamian society. Um, well, we do have uh, some information about uh, rulers in the different city-states uh, at the beginning of the third millennium BC, starting around uh, 3000 BC. We call this the early dynastic period and a dynasty is simply a family of kings. So we have some lists of kings uh, from this period. Um, one such king has become known to us under the name Gilgamesh. And most historians think that Gilgamesh was a real person. Um, the priest king, uh, one of these NC or priest kings in the city-state of Uruk, who probably lived uh, during um, the century between 2700 and 2600 BC in Uruk. And uh, some groups will have um, a selection from the great literary work known as the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, this is really the first great work of literature that has come down to us um, from this early period of civilization. Um, now, obviously, the epic uh, has a lot of legendary elements, a lot of mythical elements. The whole story is embellished, um, but we think that Gilgamesh was a real, um, a real person. But uh, I'll save you any further commentary. We'll talk about this at length uh, in class when we discuss the epic of Gilgamesh. Um, as the third millennium BC progressed, however, uh, we see the first of several attempts to unify Mesopotamia, this time under the leadership of the Akkadians from the central part of uh, Mesopotamia. And it happened that a very powerful ruler named Sargon emerged in this region of Akkad. And um, Sargon made it his project to conquer and control all of Mesopotamia. And he did establish effective control over the region by the year 2334 um, BC. And so he became the ruler of a united Akkadian empire. And uh, all groups will have a brief one-page um, document about uh, Sargon also as part of our, our next document discussion. Um, now the Acad Akkadians were, had somewhat different ethnic origins from the Sumerians. Specifically, they spoke a, uh, what we call a Semitic language, a language from the Semitic family of languages. Um, and the most famous Semitic language is Hebrew. And so this shows that the Akkadians had some kinship with the Hebrew people. And specifically, the Akkadians had very similar ideas about property uh, with the Hebrews. If, if you look at the Hebrew Bible, obviously the Hebrews believed in private property. Uh, if they didn't, why would they have, as one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not steal? That implies that um, people are allowed to have their own property. And also thou shalt not covet. Uh, it implies that you shouldn't leave your neighbor's property alone. 
Um, and so when Sargon became the ruler of the Sicadian Empire, he took the land away from the temple priests and gave it back to private landowners in keeping with this Semitic uh, belief that individuals should be able to own um, property. And also Sargon very effectively took control of religious life in Mesopotamia. Uh, one way he did this was by appointing friends and family members to be priests and priestesses. For example, his daughter in Heduana became the high priestess of the moon goddess Nana. Um, and so uh, Sargon did manage to reunify Mesopotamia using these methods. But the Akkadian Empire did not last uh, really very long, less than 150 years. By 2190 BC, um, the Akkadian Empire collapsed. And in the Sumerian King List, one of the documents I referred to earlier, at the end of this period, it has a kind of poignant entry. Who was king? Who was not king? In other words, the kingship had become like a revolving door, one after the other. Um, and uh, confusion and chaos reigned, and uh, around 2190 BC, um, Mesopotamia went back to its normal state um, of having disunited, warring city-states, not one unified uh, government. And uh, that was partly because when you get a whole bunch of people together in cities, it becomes very difficult to control them. <laughs> uh, and so Mesopotamia, unlike Egypt, as we'll see later, um, normally was disunited and uh, decentralized, and it was very hard to establish one unified central government over all of Mesopotamia because the people were living in cities, and that made them uh, quite a bit harder to control and to dominate. All right, well, in this lecture, um, with just a mention of possible connection between the Mesopotamians and the Hebrews. Um, if you look at the book of Genesis again, you see the story of Abraham, uh, and the Bible says that Abraham came from Ur of the Chaldees, in other words, the city-state of Ur in Mesopotamia, and was called by God to migrate westward to the land of Canaan, uh, what we now call Palestine or Israel, um, and became the ancestor of the Hebrew uh, people. And so uh, this, uh, most scholars think, uh, this migration uh, happened about 1850 BC. Whether or not there was a real person um, named Abraham, strictly, strictly speaking as historians, we can't say. But it does seem that there was a strong cultural connection between the Hebrew people and the Mesopotamians. And I think you'll see that the rest of the groups will be reading an excerpt from the Hebrew Bible about the flood story, and we'll be comparing that to the flood story as told in the Epic of Gilgamesh. And, and uh, in class, we'll talk in detail about the similarities and differences between those two accounts.